Now, we're looking today at the subject of Jesus' ascension. And many people know a lot about the significant events in Jesus' life and ministry. They know about his birth. They know about his arrest and crucifixion. They know about his resurrection. But one of the most important events in Jesus' life and ministry, we don't talk about that much, and that is actually an event known as the ascension of Jesus Christ. And here in a nutshell is the doctrine of the ascension. After the resurrection, the resurrected Christ spent a period of time with his disciples. During this time, he appeared to over 500 people. And then one day, the ascension, when Jesus ascended into the heavens in full view of his disciples with the promise that one day he will return. Now, the resurrection was a bodily resurrection of Jesus from the grave. It wasn't a spiritual resurrection, a metaphysical resurrection, a spooky resurrection. It was a bodily resurrection of Jesus from the grave. And likewise, the ascension of Jesus Christ, when he ascended into heaven, was a bodily ascension. It wasn't a mysterious ascension, an astral um, um, uh, uh, ascension, an ascension accompanied by spooky theremin music. No, it was a real Jesus in a real body rising and rising and rising until he was out of sight. And you can read about the ascension in our focus scripture for today. Acts chapter 1 Verses 4 through 10. Acts 1, verses 4 through 10. I just want to read you these verses, and then I want to kind of go through this passage verse by verse and make a few points about this really key event in Jesus' life, his ascension. Reading in verse 4, on one occasion, while he was eating with them. Now, this is the resurrected Christ. This is after he is resurrected from the grave. On one ascension, while he, the resurrected Christ, was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, And to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And I pray God's blessing upon the reading of his word. Now, I don't know about you, but this is one of those times in the Bible that I want to just jump into scripture and I wish I could have been there. Jesus has a meal with his disciples. He repeats the Great Commission to them, the Acts version of the Great Commission. Now for a third time, he repeats this commission to go to be witnesses to the world. And then they go outside and he begins to rise up into the atmosphere. Literally in the Bible, in verse 9 of our scripture, he was taken up and a cloud hid him from their sight. Before the airplane... Before the hot air balloon, before human flight of any kind, oh, to be there personally. We don't know a lot about his ascension. How fast did he go? Was it a slow ascension? Uh, Was it a really fast ascension? How high did he go? 
What was the cloud like? Was it a low fog or is it, was it one of those high, wispy, serious clouds? And they're watching him for minutes and minutes and minutes. And finally, well, there he goes behind a, a cloud. We don't know. But what a story. And there's a lot that we don't know. But I want you to notice a few things about Jesus' ascension that we do know. And the first thing I want you to notice is this. Jesus' ascension took place in the context of relationship. Jesus' ascension took place in the context of relationship. In our scripture, verse 4, we read that Jesus was eating a meal with his disciples. They, They were his friends and his followers. And if you cultivate a relationship with Jesus as a friend you too will see Jesus act in miraculous ways. And this is why we talk about having a relationship with Christ. Not just knowing about Jesus. The Bible says the demons know about Jesus. Not just serving Jesus. Martha served, but Jesus told her, Martha, there's a more excellent way. Not serving Jesus, not knowing about Jesus, but a relationship with Jesus. Sitting with Jesus, loving Jesus, talking to Jesus, hearing from Jesus. You know, relationship. That's when Jesus' ascension took place. And the next thing we know about this Jesus' ascension is that before he went, he told them about the Holy Spirit. Reading in verse 4, do not leave Jerusalem, Jesus said, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speaking about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Every time the Great Commission is, is, is seen in the Bible, we see the Holy Spirit. Here, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses. In the Lucan version of the Great Commission, that repentance of sins and remissions of sins will be preached everywhere. But wait for the promised Holy Spirit to come. And then um, Jesus said in, uh, in Matthew 28 that his Holy Spirit would guide them and give them the authority to be witnesses. for The Holy Spirit... The full title of the book of Acts is known as the Acts of the Apostles, you know, the establishment and growth of the early church. And we see the apostles after Jesus ascended into heaven, the Acts of the Apostles. But even a more accurate title of this book might be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. For it's the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts that Jesus promises. And it's the Holy Spirit that Jesus says to wait for before doing anything. And then it was the Holy Spirit who came at Pentecost and the gospel was preached and people were there from all over the world and they heard the gospel in their own language and 3,000 were saved and the church was launched. And it was the Holy Spirit who led Peter and Paul and Philip and the others on their missionary journeys. And it was the Holy Spirit who filled Stephen as he was being stoned who even then prayed for those who were persecuting him. The Holy Spirit is the functionary in every significant event in the book of Acts. And today, anything significant you ever do for God will only be accomplished in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5.18. That's why Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Folks, the greatest way you can accomplish something in your life is for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, for him to walk with you and talk with you and tell you that he is your own, for him to lead you and guide you and direct you and animate you. Jesus has ascended into heaven, but his spirit can now not only be on you and with you, but can be in you. And everything significant you accomplish in your spiritual life will only be accomplished through the animation of the Holy Spirit. Apart from him, you can do nothing. 
So he, he talks about the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 6, Jesus' followers then gathered around him and said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? That was the messianic hope of the Jews. They had seen him teach. They had seen him organize. They had seen him inspire. And they're thinking, this guy could lead an army, the kingdom of Israel. We can overthrow Rome and restore Israel. They saw him feed thousands. Why, in their minds, well, he could even feed an army. They saw him heal people. He could even heal an army. They saw him bring back people from the grave. He can bring back. So hanging on to this idea that Jesus was going to act in a big, showy way to overthrow Rome and establish his kingdom. In their minds, that kingdom was a restored Israel. Are you going to restore Israel? Are you going to restore the kingdom? And then Jesus answered them in verse 7 and said, Hey, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Man, it's in his timing Folks, we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't know the future. But atheists don't know the future. None of us know the future. So which would you rather have? Would you rather walk into the future with Jesus? Or would you rather walk into the future with nothing? With nothing. Then the next thing I want you to notice about this passage of scripture is that Jesus challenges them again with yet another version of the great commission that lofty goal I preached on last week from Luke it's also in Matthew 28 and here's the great commission to be filled with the Holy Spirit and then to go and teach and preach and tell the good news of Jesus and it's right here in verse 8 that you'll receive power Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes upon you Then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, that was the land surrounding Jerusalem, in Samaria, that was a land next to Jerusalem, and then to the ends of the earth. This is a command and a strategy. The command is, Jesus said, be my witnesses. Testify to me. And then the strategy, do it by reaching your city, Jerusalem, your Jerusalem, your region, Judea, other neighboring regions, and then, yes, even globally to all the earth. And we're commanded by Jesus to do it all. He said Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world. He didn't just say to choose one, Jerusalem or Judea or. He didn't say sequentially, Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria. No, everything at once. Reach your local city, and go all the way global with the gospel. Do it all. Do it all. Reach the world from Greenwood, South Carolina. Local community transformation, national mission projects from North Carolina to Utah. We have a mission team in in, in Cherokee, North Carolina right now, ministering to the Peaks Church. Mission projects in Utah. And then globally, Andy tells me that this year we will have at least 17 missionaries from our church on mission trips in five continents this year from South Main Baptist Church. From South Main Baptist Church. So it's a, it's a global strategy, but it's also a local strategy. Go across the sea, but also go across the street to your neighbor, to your Jerusalem. But then I want you to notice something else about this Great Commission. The Great Commission isn't just something that we do. The Great Commission isn't just something we do. Look, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Witnessing isn't just something that we do at South Main Baptist Church. It's who we are as believers, witnesses for Jesus Christ. On your job, your primary job is to be a witness for Jesus Christ with your life and with your lips in your home. Your primary job is not to be a mom or dad or wife or husband. It's to be a witness 
continually testifying and exemplifying Jesus in all that you do, in your neighborhood, caring for others in the name of Jesus. It's what we do, but even more than that, it's who we are. And if the Great Commission ever becomes who we are, we'll we'll have no problem making it what we do. And then after this, Jesus gives them this great, lofty, lofty, aspirational goal of the Great Commission. And then as if to put an exclamation point on it all, he begins to rise up in the heavens. You know, you know, Jesus from time to time has a dramatic flair, doesn't he? He gives him this great commission, and then as if to put an exclamation point on it all, he begins to rise up into the heavens. And the ascension of Jesus establishes him as truly unique. The ascension of Jesus establishes him as truly unique because others have died and rose from the grave. Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, but then they finally grew old, grew old and died. Jesus is the only one who died and rose from the grave and ascended into heaven and is alive forevermore. Other people have ascended into heaven, Elijah and Enoch. But they never died. They never defeated death. Jesus is the only one who died, was buried, defeated death, was resurrected, ascended into heaven never dying again, alive forevermore. Now, that will get people's attention, rising into heaven. That would, that would, what would this sermon be like if towards the end of it, I started rising into heaven? Y'all start taking some notes on this, man, you know. We'd bring Blaze back out. He'd be doing everything. I mean, you know, just, just, what a way to make a statement to ascend into heaven. Every, every argument, every negotiation is won if you make your point and you ascend into heaven. In your car, with your family, where do you want to go out to eat? And that begins the negotiation. Well, I want to go to Old Charlie's. I want to go to Millhouse, the kids. I want to go to Chick-fil-A. I want to go to McDonald's. You know, the ascension could put a, could put a stop to all that. Well, I want to go to Outback. And then, you know, the whole family. Yep, it's Outback. (laughs) That's where we're going. Prom night. They tell me it was prom night last night. Prom night. Yeah, my dad says I have to be home from prom by 11 o'clock tonight. And we really need to do it exactly at the time my dad said. Why? Well, he's up there hovering over. (laughs) He's up there hovering over us right now. Yep, 11 it is. On vacation, quit fighting with your sister. I'm going to pull your car over. You know, pull this car over. You know that threat. What if you could, what if the threat was quit fighting with your sister because I'm going to die, I'm going to rise from the grave, I'm going to tell you one more time, and then I'm going to ascend into heaven with the promise that I'll be back and you won't know when it is. You see, the ascension of Jesus places emphasis on his words. And, uh, and, and the last thing before the ascension wasn't to, to live a good life or to have correct doctrine um, or to tell parables. The last thing that Jesus saved before that dramatic exclamation point was to be witnesses for me. Not just to witness for me, that's something you do, but to be it. The, the, the Great Commission is something that we are. The Great Commission was the word that Jesus gave us just before he ascended, not restaurants or proms. The Great Commission to share the good news of Jesus, the message that will introduce people to grace and forgiveness, the message that will change a person's address from hell to heaven. Folks, everybody... Everywhere needs Jesus. You need Jesus. They need Jesus. We need Jesus. The real Jesus. Not the milk toast play church Jesus. A real, radical, life changing love of Jesus. Not empty religiosity, but a joy and a peace that makes others ask what happened to her. 
what happened to him. I don't know what's gotten into him, but I want that. And then after Jesus gave this great commission in verse 9, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And now look at verse 10. As they were standing there, you would think that would, put, that would kind of be the end of the account. But there is something a little anticlimactic here. In verse 10, as they were standing there, looking intently up into the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Probably the same angels. Remember the two men dressed in white that were at Jesus' grave announcing the resurrection? Possibly the same angels that had been at the tomb. These two men in white were, were standing beside them. They were looking up into heaven. The two men beside them said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you in heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go. In other words, why are you standing there staring? Jesus is coming back soon. We're to carry on his work. Stop staring and get to work. Jesus is ascended. The Holy Spirit is given. And we are now to be the hands and feet of Jesus his witnesses to the world. I'm going to ask the band to come. We're going to play a closing worship song. And let's just worship the Lord with all that is within us as we do this final, this final, this final song. And, and this ends, listen folks, this ends the congregational sermon for today. But it begins the personal sermon that God is speaking to your heart. Because you know in the Bible you have the logos, the, the, the preached word, the heard word. But then you have the rhema, that personal word of God. That when you hear a sermon, God's preaching a sermon to you and personalizing it to your life. The rhema, the personal word of God. And I'm sure that 2,000 years ago after the disciples heard Jesus' challenge, Jesus' great commission, they thought, where should we begin what should we do? And Jesus said, okay, here's how you begin. Carry, wait, and pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's where you begin. You begin in prayer and saying, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ comes, He will guide you into all truth. And it's the same today. We want people to make all kinds of decisions to run who, to and fro doing God's will. But I'm afraid that, that we might be sending people out into the, into, the, into the gospel field that aren't full of his spirit. That's step one. You've heard God's vision for the world, for his followers to be witnesses everywhere at every time. And you know where to begin now. You begin by being filled with the Spirit. So the surprise ending here in the message, before we do missions, we ask God to do a mission in our heart. We pray, Lord, fill me with your Spirit and everything that we ask according to His will, He does. Many people are praying to know God's will in missions when they should be praying to know God. Lord, what are you leading me to do? I want to know God's will. No, you should be praying, Lord, I want to know God, because if you know God, you're going to know his will. I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I, know, I want to know your will, but more than that, I want to know you. I want to know you. And that's the message that Jesus gave right before he rose into the heavens. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we don't know the, the specificities of this message to every heart. It's going to be, if there are 300 people here, it's going to be 300 different messages at this point. In 20 years, we could be in 100 different places. 
So the different specifics about what we do aside, though, there is one commonality. We need your Holy Spirit to lead us, to be in us, to guide us, to empower us, to animate us, to lead us. The greatest thing that you can do today is to be filled with the Spirit. Now, for those of you who aren't Christians, that just simply means giving all that you know of yourself to all that you know of Jesus Christ. Lord, I give you everything. I've been running my own life. Just pray that to him. Lord, I've been running my own life 20, 30, 40 years. But you're, you made me. You created me. I'm ready for you, Lord, to have my life. I radically surrender my life to you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit. And the Bible says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if you've, if you've, um, if you've done that, make sure you tell somebody here at our church before you leave, we have some materials that will help you to grow as a Christian. But now Christians, some of you are Christians. You remember praying that prayer. You remember being saved. You followed him in baptism and church membership, all those things. But lately you've been kind of directing your own life again, making your own choices, living your life in your own creativity and ingenuity, living your life in your own strength. You've dethroned the Holy Spirit. And you're now back on the throne of your life. And that's why things just don't seem right. So to be the witness that the Lord would have you to be, you need to be filled with the Spirit. And that's to say something like this. Christians, you need to rededicate your life to the Lord too. It's a lot like getting saved, except you're already saved. But it's something like this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a Christian. Just pray that to him. But lately... I've been kind of making my own decisions, living my life in my own strength. And as a result, I've sinned against you. And so today, I pray that you will again dethrone me and that you'll get back in the throne of my life, ruling and reigning. Fill me with your spirit that I might be the witness that you would have me to be. I'm tired of being a Martha, just doing religiosity, doing witnessing. I want to be a witness for you. Lord Jesus, thank you that um, I know you've got the power because you rose from the grave. You ascended into heaven and you're coming again soon. In Jesus' name, amen.